This all started for me when I was five years old. That's me. I know. I'm adorable. When my great uncle Joe, that's him, sat me down and told me the story of the last man in Pennsylvania to die by electrocution. It was a story of murder, burglary, and a broken watch. In the 17 years that have followed, I've been on a search to find out as much information about the subject as possible. This is what I knew at the beginning. Fact number one. Elmo Smith broke into the home of Joseph and Teresa Briggs. Fact number two. Elmo Smith stole the Briggs's car and Teresa Briggs's watch. Fact number three. Elmo Smith killed a young woman. Fact number four. Elmo Smith was found guilty and died by electrocution. Summation? I did not know very much. The following documentary is a result of that search, as I tried to piece together a murder that occurred 50 years ago in a place that has completely changed, in a world that no longer blinks at the thought of violence. Montgomery County in 1959 was not the same as it is today. At this time, the idea of a crime as gruesome as rape and murder only happened in other places. The following events not only affected those involved, it directly affected the way crime is viewed in the entire of Montgomery County for the future. December 12, 1959. On that date, uh, we were going to uh, uh, an affair up at the Knights of Columbus, which was two, hour, two, two houses up from where we lived, my brother John came with us, came to pick us up. We went up, met his wife, and it was everyone else that was at the Christmas party. And shortly after we got there, our, my neighbor that lived on the second floor, Mr. Lawback, came up and said that to, uh, to the Knights of Columbus, said our apartment was on fire. So everyone that was there, of course, went down to see what was going on. The fire trucks were out front and the firemen were in the house fighting the fire. And uh, after they left, we went in to see what had happened. And there were several fires set in, in our apartment, which consisted of Christmas gifts and various things like that. <clears throat> after the fire truck left, my husband went to one of the firemen that was still there and asked where they had moved our car, which was parked in front of where we were living, and they said that they did not move it, that when they arrived that space was empty. A portable radio was missing, my watch was missing. Father gave it to me for my high school graduation, which was two years before this happened, and I was not wearing the watch because it was broken. So that was at the house. December 18th, 1959. Joyce Davis is attacked by an assailant. It was first reported that she was attacked by a teenager. December 27th, 1959. Three 12-year-old girls in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania are attacked. After they escape, they see their assailant enter a Chevrolet Bel Air that is white and brown. December 28th, 1959. After seeing South Pacific with three friends in Roxborough, Pennsylvania, 16-year-old Marianne Mitchell is left waiting for a bus to return her to her home in Maniunk when a Chevrolet Bel Air pulls over and drags her into the car. There that night, when for the first time Marianne doesn't return before curfew, her father Edwin Mitchell calls the police. December 28th through the 30th. During this time, Marianne is raped and eventually beaten to death by a tire iron. During the 28 hours that occur between when she is last seen and when her body is found, her killer scrawled TB and 101 in lipstick on her abdomen, along with some wavy lines. What this message means is never discovered. December 30th, approximately 2.30 a.m. Marianne Mitchell's body is left in a gully off of Hearts Lane in White Marsh. December 30th, approximately 2 p.m. Four employees of the White Marsh Township Highway Department spotted the body while driving down Hart's Lane. The girl's clothes were torn, as was her body. Missing were her shoes and undergarments. 
In her pockets were 61 cents and a tube of lipstick. On her fingers were an amethyst ring and a class ring with the initials MTM. There was no purse or identification found, so at the time the body had not been identified. But later that day, the rings were confirmed by the father, and the body is identified as Marianne Mitchell, 16-year-old junior at Cecilia Academy. December 31st, 1959. A small army of investigators from all over Montgomery and Philadelphia County start their search for the items missing from Marianne Mitchell. Soon her wallet and shoes are discovered, and the police are given a tip for where her purse was found, which leads them to 18-year-old Charles Gorman, who witnessed a 1958 Chevrolet Bel Air, which, when Gorman had started his car, quickly sped off without its lights on. The second shoe of Marianne Mitchell was found blocks away from the movie theater that Marianne had gone to on the night she was abducted. Word also came from the coroner's office, proving that rape had occurred, and the cause of death is released of multiple skull fractures from a sharp weapon. January 2nd, 1960. Police begin to question any moral or sexual offenders in the area. Also, through cross-checking of old cases, they come to a burglary and arson of Joseph and Teresa Briggs' apartment. Among items taken is a two-tone 1958 Chevrolet Bel Air. January 4th, 1960. The funeral of Mary Ann Mitchell occurs at St. Josephat's Church in Philadelphia County. At the police station, the detectives turn their attention to the next moral offender on their list to question an ex-con by the name of Elmo Smith. He had just been released from 10 years in prison for charges of burglary and aggravated assault of five women. They took Smith in for questioning, holding him on a 48-hour charge. Upon search of the suspect was found scratches that could have been made by fingernails. When asking for his whereabouts on the night in question, Smith had told the police he had gone to the movies. When checking the alibi, Smith recanted the story and told another that he had done chores for his mother. Meanwhile, the police had begun searching Smith's apartment, finding a pair of blood-stained shoes, socks, and trousers. And then, the biggest clue in the case was revealed by the throwing of a rock. A Bridgeport resident had phoned the police that someone had thrown a rock at her. And when the police toured the neighborhood for the thrower, when he came upon a two-tone 1958 Chevrolet Bel Air, Found in the car, along with various blood stains, was a prayer book with Marianne Mitchell's name and a bumper jack matted with dry blood and hair, which fits the autopsy's murder weapon. January 5, 1960. A physician examines Elmo Smith's scratches and reports that they have been made by fingernails. While it seemed that the evidence piling up on Smith, there was also evidence that proved him innocent. As this was before DNA testing, the blood found on Smith was coded as the same blood type as Marianne Mitchell, which happened to be the same blood type of Elmo Smith, and no fingerprints of Elmo Smith were found on the car. Stepping forward, though, was Joyce Davis, the stenographer who was stabbed previously and identified Smith as her attacker, and the three 12-year-olds who were attacked also identified Smith as their attacker. January 6, 1960 the police learn of a close friend of Elmo Smith, a Mrs. Janet Bryson, who was the daughter of a man that employed Smith after he was released from the prison following his first 10-year stint in jail. Mrs. Bryson told the police that Elmo Smith had given her a Christmas present, a watch, a watch that would later be identified as the watch stolen from Teresa Briggs. The watch that was stolen from me, uh was given to his girlfriend for a Christmas present, and that was one of the connections, and then when they found the car, they, could, they knew. Final summation of evidence. Elmo Smith gives a watch to Janet Bryson that has proven to be stolen from Tess Briggs on December 12th, the same night that the Briggs' car is stolen. Later, Smith is brought in with bloody clothes found at his house and find the car that has the prayer book of Marianne Mitchell along with the murder weapon. January 8, 1960. Elmo Smith confesses and pleads guilty at a hearing. He would later recant his confession and the case was sent to Gettysburg due to extreme prejudice against Smith in Montgomery County. In Gettysburg, Smith was found guilty and sentenced to death by electrocution. He would die on April 2, 1962, the last man in Pennsylvania to be put to death by the electric chair. 
After this case, Montgomery County was changed. No longer were they impervious to the ever-violent world around them. Elmo Smith did more to the county than kill a perfectly innocent girl. In a world that no longer blinks at violence, he made this town blink for the first time.